All right, let's get started. Um, I hear I call to order the July 9th, 2020 business meeting. And if you'd like to link to this uh, meeting, you can uh, go to clackamas.us and link to the meeting. And with that, I will turn it over to Gary to take the roll. Chair, first our staff support today, Mary Rathke, clerk to the board, Stephen Madcore, county council. Um, also our rest of our team, Dylan Blaylock, Garrett Teague, Rich Marvin from Public and Government Affairs, who are helping with the tech side of our meeting, and Christina Twilliger from County Administration to support as well. Uh, roll call, Chair Bernard. Here. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Savas. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Humberston. Here. Thank you. Please join me in a Pledge of Allegiance. So I, got a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of, America, of America and to and the to Republic the for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And we are holding this meeting virtually. If you're joining us on a Zoom app for this meeting and you are interested in providing public comment, we will prompt you regarding how to do that when the time is right. You will have the option of providing your comment to us uh, live. Alternatively, anyone can send a comment to be read during the citizen communication portion of this meeting over email. Just send it at any time during the meeting by email to clackconews at clackmas.us. Be sure to include your name and area uh, where uh, area when you email. And with that, Gary, turn it over to you. Yes, we will start with COVID updates. Uh, Nancy Bush is having an issue with her link. So any staff that can hear my voice, will you help Nancy get into the meeting? And while that is happening, I will give my update. Uh, commissioners, there were two contracts that were signed uh, due to the COVID-19 emergency declaration that you have already ratified at your June 30th, uh, 2020 issue session. But for the record, I would like to read them again so they're in your business meeting notes. And those contracts are for health, housing, and human services, approval of amendment number two, to do good Multnomah to administer a motel voucher program. The cost is $22,500. The funding comes from Federal CARES Act funds, no general funds. So I did sign this on your behalf on June 29th, 2020, and then you did ratify that action on June 30th, 2020. Second, for disaster management, approval to apply for an intergovernmental agreement for COVID-19 respite shelter between Clackamas County and Washington County. This is required under the governor's phase one reopening uh, expectations. The cost is $305,325. This comes entirely from the general fund. Our expectation is that we would be reimbursed from the state from Federal CARES Act funding. Uh, you did authorized this on June 30th, 2020. I did not sign it, you just directly approved it. But again, for the record, I'm restating both of these so they're in the minutes of your business meeting. Do you have any further questions, commissioners, on either of those two contracts? No. See none. Um, I still don't see Nancy Bush, but I see Dr. Present is in the waiting room. Perhaps we could bring her in. Uh, and she can, uh, she and I can tap dance until Nancy comes in. Uh, uh, so we'll bring her in and give you a quick update and answer your question. Oh, I see Nancy. All right. Uh, oh, there she is. Okay, perfect. Uh, so wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, Nancy Bush, Director of Disaster Management and Incident Commander of our Emergency Operations Center and Dr. Sarah Present, our Clackamas County Health Officer, are here to give you an update and answer your questions. Go ahead, please. Nancy, go ahead. All right, um, just a moment. I think I'm still having a little bit of issue here. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, 
right. Sorry, we had. Oh, we lost you. Okay, so I think. Go ahead, Nancy, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, we're still having some technical issues, but so I'll give you some numbers here on uh, July 9th. So on Oregon, we have 10,817. Um, I'm getting some, I'm sorry, I'm getting horrible. Okay. Uh, I think, okay, 10,817 positives and 422 of those are new. Um, we have 224 deaths and 265, 450, 265,450 negatives. Clackamas County now has 894 positives with 33 deaths. I am sorry, with that's up 33. We have 25 deaths, 25,922 negatives. Multnomah County has uh, 2,608 positives, up 79. There are 72 deaths, which is up three, 58,435 negatives. Washington County has 1,676 positives, which is up 56 from uh, Wednesday. 20 deaths, 36,849 negatives. Uh, we have 124 hospitalized now um, in the state, and those are known COVIDs. 40 of those are in ICU beds, and 23 of those are on ventilators. Um, so statewide, um, just because I know we we're going to have a question about the ICU beds, there are 124 available statewide, and uh, we have 781 that are staffed. Um, and we have 700, um, around 700 ventilators that are also available. So um, also just to let you know what is going on here in the region with our hospitals, uh, we do have um, 19 COVID patients that are on vents. We have COVID admits, ad admits that have been tested of 127. There are 45 available ICU beds here in the region. And we have 427 vents that are not in use. Um, the, we did have a few questions last week, mostly I think from uh, uh, Commissioner Fisher about uh, some of the other states and what some of their rates are. So I wanted to just pull that in and let you know what those top states are with the highest rates coming back positive. We have Arizona with 26.83%. Um, Florida has almost 19% of theirs coming in positive. South Carolina has almost 17. Texas has a little over 14%. Alabama has a little over 14%. And here in Oregon, we're reporting, um, this was on the John Hopkins site, they reported 5.6%, um, which is up just a little bit of what we saw the other day, but John Hopkins data sometimes is updated a little bit faster. Uh, to let you know what's going on here in public with our public health in the EOC, we did meet with the uh, school superintendents this week uh, regarding plans uh, for each of the schools that are, we are going to be reviewing and taking a look at um, and trying to help them through some of the decision making that they're they're trying to do and trying to um, you know figure out how they're going to work with all of the kids in the school, all the teachers, and how to make everything safe. We are seeing about 18 to 20 cases per day routinely. And uh, we are working on a new long-term care facility um, outbreak plan. Um, our PIOs are continuing to coordinate with the liaison section to develop messaging related to face coverings and anti-racism ra outreach. So we do have the new metrics that just came in um, late yesterday and I'm gonna have Dylan bring those up for me, please. So we are still here in the region. You'll notice uh, Clackamas County, uh, we'll talk about the region in just a second, but the Clackamas County, we are still missing uh, three of the six now. Last week it was two of six, now it is three of six. We are now uh, the uptrend of 3.8% of the uh, tests that are positive in the last seven days. A percent increase in new in cases in the last seven days is now, um, let's see, 29%. And the percent of cases not traced to, traced to a known source is now 47%. Um, Dylan, if you'll go down to the very end of the document is actually where they're now putting the tri-county. And there you'll see that we are missing, or that as a region, uh, we're missing the same 
um, indicators there. And if when you look at Washington County and Multnomah County, it's the same indicators that are being missed in those areas as well. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Present now, and she's, I think, going to talk about this a little bit longer, and then uh, we will take some questions. I, I have to ask, if you all could just leave that county indicator screen up, um, at, or uh, available, so that that, that uh, I can refer to it later on, but bring it, make sure you bring it back, Dylan. Okay, thank you. We will. Dr. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add to the indicators this week. Um, I've said in the past, and again, they, they will fluctuate up and down. Um, given that we, we have many more cases than we um, did at the beginning of this, but we're still fairly low prevalence. And as um, because of that, the denominators are low, which can make these indicator numbers jump um, you know, fairly significant from week to week. Um, but I do think that overall we are, you know, still in, um, we're still well in this pandemic and outbreak is active and spreading in our community. We do have active community wide spread. We, um, on our own data poll, which is really uh, more pre preliminary numbers, uh, we have 133 cases over the last week from July 1st to July 7th. Um, a similar time frame as this, but we the numbers show up a little bit differently based on how we pull them out. <clears throat> of those 133, 75 or 56 percent of the cases were sporadic, so uh, we were not able to um, connect them to a known other uh, source case. So that is a, a significant increase from what we had been seeing previously, which was more around 40 percent. Um, 24% or 32 of those 133 cases were household contacts. So people living in the same household is another case. Um, five of them or 4% um, were other close contacts. So like neighborhood, uh, family, not necessarily in the same household, but also uh, very close contacts outside of um, work sites, et cetera. Um, so that's a total of 28% or, or household or close contact spread um, that's identified. And then 16% of the 133 or 21 total were parts of outbreaks. So in the past, when I've talked with you, um, I have um, had an actual breakdown of the long-term care facility versus other types of outbreaks. I don't have that now, but we have many fewer of our cases in long-term care facility outbreaks in the last week. We are really seeing a lot of workplace notifications, um, a lot of workplace, you know, small business, uh, small workplace, um, outbreaks, um, but I also want to give that caveat that two cases is considered an outbreak. So if you have two cases in a, in a work setting, such as, um, you know, even if we had two cases in our emergency operations center, then that would be considered an outbreak there. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not controllable. Um, so um, we have many more kind of small workplace uh, cases in the last week to two weeks than we had previously. And that's sort of the um, descriptive uh, um, description of what we've been, what I've been seeing in the last week. We've also been working, as Nancy mentioned, with um, trying to ensure that our plans are in place to help our schools reopen. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with um, with the region, with OHA, and then I had a meeting with Philip, our uh, public health director, and the school superintendents earlier this week, and we're working through a lot of the questions and unknowns so that, that the schools can be ready to be open as safely as possible and submit their plans. Um, <clears throat> as far as, excuse me, that was loud. Um, as far as our staffing in public health, we have not brought on, well, we have brought on a couple new people since I saw, since I spoke with you last. Uh, we're really working on workflows and management of new staff and continuing to work on training um, as well as um, um, getting the right training protocols in place. Again, uh, the, the challenges of bringing on 30 new people all at once um, is there are lots and we're working through them. So I think that our, the, the staff that we've hired are still uh, training up but getting close to being more independent. Um, and we have um, lists of applications for uh, continuing to hire as needed. Um, going forward, I think that right now we're focusing on ensuring adequate and full training of all the ones that we've we've hired to this point. 
And I will stop there. Okay, before I go to Paul, on that chart, I thought anything below uh, 5% uh, percentage of positives was good. And we were below 5 if I remember that chart. Clackamas County is currently at about 4% positive, which so, under 5 is good, yes. But it, so it shows that we did not make it. Uh, that's because it's a slight uptrend from our previous. So okay. th what they're watching is, are we having an increase in the percent positivity? However, overall, we are still under 5%. All right, thank you. Paul and then Ken. Yeah, um, thank you both Nancy and Dr. President. Um, now that the county indicators are up on the screen, I had a question because as I looked at this and was listening, um, to the news and others that our, that our numbers are up. I, I think it was some messaging that came out of the county yesterday. Um, our total number of, of new cases in the last seven days is lower than the previous seven days. So when we say that, when we message that our, our new cases are up in the last seven days, um, and in reality, they're not up from the previous seven. So why is that? I mean, are we actually comparing, when we say that based on, on these new numbers on a seven day period, are we comparing that to a different previous circumstance? I mean, what, what, what is that? When we say it's, it's, it's greater than what it was before, what was before? So I mean, are you, I'm sorry, are you talking about the, the positives in the last seven days? Yes, yeah, Can we, we, we have a message yesterday coming out of EOC um, staff and, and PGA that our cases are up in the last seven days compared to what or when? It, my, it, from, the, from what I understand, this number is from the previous week. And okay. I know think that's President, right. if you have more information on that. But that's what the OHA, my understanding is they're comparing this to the previous week and that's why it's an uptrend. Well, I, I would go, I would uh, go back and have you take a look at those numbers um, and look at the dailies. And I, I did a compilation. I've been doing a compilation of that and our numbers are actually been falling from the previous seven days. But this is the percent of tests. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the new cases. The new, but, the but, this, but that, that particular uh, column that is now 3.8 is talking about the percentage of tests. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the new cases. What we, what we messaged yesterday, we said yesterday that our, 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 our new cases, there's more new cases than the previous, you know, in the last seven days. And my question is compared to what? Well, and that may be we may need to take a look at that language because if we're to, that is really related to, um, it's based on 7-1, I just found out, on July 1st. On July 1st, okay. Yeah, I just found that out. So it's, it's, it's July 9th, so the previous seven days or, or, or what it was on July 1st. We're using the data because the data comes in on certain days, from my understanding. All right. Right. I, so I, I, I guess what I would do is I just encourage you to go back and actually look at the daily counts for Clackamas County. And, and all, yeah. all I'm trying to say is that in the, in the last seven days, if you total them up, and it's 148 from, from what came out of the OHA yesterday, it's 148 in, in those seven days back to, to last week. And if you look at that seven day period from last week, the previous seven, the numbers are less than they were. So I want to just point that out. But the um, percentages are higher. Yes. That's what it's saying. Percentage of positives is higher. I, I, that, that I get, but that's, that's different language than saying there, are, there are, are more new positive cases. That's different language. So if we, I, I don't remember, I was trying to find what last week's was. So the, um, 
percent increase in new cases in the last seven days, right? If we have 29% increase from the prior seven days this week, but last week we had 30% increase from the prior seven days to that, that means that our rate of increase is decreasing, I think is what you're getting at. Right. And so, so we need, I, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now to speak directly to that. And I, um, and I agree with you, I, I, from a sort of subjective standpoint, just watching the cases come in, we have stayed pretty stable at the number of cases that we're getting. I have not seen a huge rate of rise of cases in our last week. So I do find that that is uh, reassuring um, and isn't well um, depicted by this particular number. <clears throat> And, and I and I want to just put put an emphasis on that because it was just a few weeks ago or a couple weeks ago where the governor um, was in and a lot of us were repeating that and no one would disagree that if we kept on going at the same rate we would be up to a thousand new cases per day and that's what I'm, I want to use that context and that nuance and then when the governor three weeks ago sent us the letter declining our effort to go into phase two she cited new cases a spike in new cases not a spike in the rate of positives of the test, but a spike. So I'm trying to use the same language and the same metric and carry that through and make sure that we're consistent. Um, my other question is, as we can see this, there's no county that's really all green. All counties are, are, don't, are, don't have good indicators. And this is a very similar scenario as it was three weeks ago when the governor allowed Marion County to go into phase two. They, they, were, they, were only, they only hit three of their six and they, they were allowed to go into phase two and we were declined. And I just wanna point that out. Um, so my question is when we messaged yesterday that we haven't met the six indicators, it, are, are, is, is there a new rule now that in order to go to phase two, because I haven't seen that written anywhere, is there a new rule that we have to meet all six? because no one's meeting all six. You have not received that information, no. Okay, so is it our, is it our policy? This, we're depending, the governor is, it's not our policy. I'm, we are, I mean, as you know, we sent in a request to the governor and she said no. So we, we can send the request in, but it is up to the governor to decide if the if she's okay with our metrics or not to say we can go into phase two. Okay, I just want to because I'm get, I'm getting this question because uh, and I think we have to answer it. If we're, mm -hmm. if our PSA yesterday, our public service announcement yesterday is we haven't met we haven't met all six, and therefore we we we're not eligible to apply. That rule is not written anywhere. No, and I'm I'm sorry. I mean I'm not sure about the language, but I think that what we are saying to the public is we're not meeting half of our metrics. It just, the, and which is true. I mean, that's just, um, I think that that is, we are just we're letting everyone know, which this should be up on the OHA page, I think around noon today, that we're meeting on only half of the metrics at this time. Well, I, that is accurate, but it's not as accurate to say we, we're not ready for phase two because of it. That's not really a rule. If it's, if it's not a state rule, then, and, and that's where I'm struggling. That's my, my, my request to the governor was clarification. Mm -hmm. On the metrics and I think we deserve that and I think one of my colleagues said we need consistency so we need to know what the rules are we need to know where the goalposts are we need to be consistent and public safety and people's lives are in incredibly important um, and I, I want to echo that and I think my letter to the governor covered that very well the last thing I want to say is that just in the last seven day period our numbers like I mentioned before were 148 new cases and Multnomah counties were 376 and, the, and, and it's basically, the, Multnomah County is about two and a half to three times the amount of cases on average um, every single day. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Ken, Sonia, and then Martha. <clears throat> well, since this started, I, uh, our position has been about one third of, of the other two counties almost consistently the entire time. That, that hasn't changed. The, the um, the fact is, is that whatever the goalposts are, we don't get to determine what they are. The governor and OHA is making that determination. And a month ago, they may have been okay with 
uh, a goalpost that allowed Marion County to do it with, with two areas that had not met the metrics, but then they changed uh, what, they, what they found acceptable. Um, and we're stuck with that at this point. I do think we should continue to have the conversations with the governor uh, and with OHA, um, but they're making judgment calls on this whole thing um, that we don't have the authority to make. My direct question is, we're not meeting the metric on tracing. And my, I, I'm curious as to why that is. Are, is it people are refusing to answer questions or is it our folks uh, are not trained up sufficiently yet? Uh, do we have any sense of why uh, we're not meeting the tracing metric? Actually, are you talking about the last column? He's talking about the, the ones linked to other cases. Is that oh, correct? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the last column is how, uh, you know, the percentage with the initial um, um, outreach call within 24 hours, which we are meeting. Um, so in the last week, um, like I said, we had 133 that I'm counting. Of those 16 of them, we were unable to reach. So that's an increase. Um, they just, they, uh, people not answering their phones or having the wrong phone number or no good contact information. Um, two of them had refused an interview. So that does happen. Um, and then five of them had not gotten an interview yet. So they were still in the process of attempting to reach them to interview. Um, I think, and uh, the other piece of information I have that I did not give to you previously were that that um, the total of contacts identified were 352, which is an average of 3.2 contacts per case, which is up a bit. Um, again, that's, that's not a great number because some people have 30 contacts and some people who are already in quarantine or in long-term care facilities, those are not all counted as contacts. Um, so the, I, I think that there is a mixture of the Interviewing, um, it's, it is a rapid interview. The staff are busy. Uh, there's not a lot of the time to really dig in and um, make a lot of connections. And that's part of our, our staffing management that we're really working on. But when, uh, when we have 20 cases a day, part of it is, is um, you know, you, you get the basic information you need and then, we, and then we make the connections later potentially. So some of these may be um, connected in ways that don't show up until the next interview, and it's like, oh, that one was connected to that one, and then we and then we can make those connections later. Um, so there's a combination of the interviewing, the willingness to give information, and that I think that there is a lot of sporadic um, community spread that is unidentifiable. So I would say that the majority of it is probably the latter, that there's unidentifiable community spread, and it's not anybody's uh, unwillingness to give information. But that, that is a factor that, that can increase that number. So to finish up, then, if, if, if we have a situation in which uh, unidentifiable community spread is occurring, which clearly it is, yes. uh, you could reasonably assume that we might not ever be able to meet that metric, uh, though we, we will obviously try to as best we can. But it would seem to me in the discussions that the chair may have going forward with the governor and OHA that that point should be made, that that may be an impossible metric because the more people are out and about and not keeping track of where they go and who they talk to, the more difficult it would ever be to actually completely meet that metric. So we could make a reasonable argument that some flexibility on that metric uh, is, is desirable. and I. I I'll leave it at that. All right, uh, Sonia and then Martha. Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple questions. I um, listened to a continuum of care meeting yesterday regarding housing, and I understand that our vouchers for putting people that may need to self-isolate that the money is not available anymore. And so my first question is, what are we doing in those situations? That's my first question. And then my second question is, I understood in the letter that we wrote to the governor that we did apply to go into phase two when she was ready 
to allow us to move forward. So I just want to make sure we don't need to apply again. Our application has already been submitted. So I so just want to make sure I'm correct in that. Uh, we're told, we just heard yesterday that we need to apply again. Really? Even though yes, we already have applied? Only heard Nancy. So we haven't, re unless you received, received something directly from OHA or from the governor's office, I, I saw that in the newspaper, but I have not received that information directly. Um, and we have been trying to find that out. I, I think Chris Lyons on our staff has been reaching out. So hopefully we'll have that answer soon. <laughs> um, and Commissioner, you were asking about the vouchers. For those who need to isolate, if, if you have someone um, who needs quarantine because they're waiting for a test to return, or if they are known COVID, but they are, don't need to be in the hospital, those are what our respite rooms are for. So we do have those respite rooms. Okay, and where are those now? Is, I mean, you don't so have to we, tell me, but is that in a motel or is that? We have some that are here in the county that are in a cabin-like situation, and then we do have some in motel. Okay, so we do have that covered. Great, I thought we did, I just was concerned. Yeah, we do have that covered. So we were running out of dollars and given that we did not get a direct allocation for Clackamas County, I was concerned that yeah. we weren't going to be so, able to meet that need. Yeah, what we are struggling with is the voucher system for the homeless who have are 65 and older or have underlying conditions. That is something that we have run out of dollars on. We're trying to get more dollars that will start again in the fall, but our social services group is working with that population and trying to place them as best they can. Okay, yeah, I'm aware of that effort, but thank okay. you, Nancy, I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Martha. I'll be brief, I just wanna thank this, I wanna thank Nancy and, and Dr. President, all, both of you for all the hard work you're doing. This is yeah. like the never ending saga, and I know how difficult it is out there, and I particularly know how difficult it is you're answering questions for us uh, based on really what is out of your, I mean, we're getting the directives from other people. Let's recognize that. And I, for one, do think the directives are very inconsistent. Um, that's very disappointing to me that, that there's a leadership issue in terms of continuing to change the bar as we move ahead, or at least, you know, as I said, be, being tied regionally, uh, I understand the medical reasons for that. However, that should have been done from the get-go. And I'm very disappointed that we kind of went down one road and then suddenly we're moved to another. Um, so that's just my comment with that. I, I, I really feel you guys are doing a great job. I do feel that we're dealing with inconsistency from the other levels of uh, governance and we're just going to have to live with it so that's it. all right let's uh finish up paul yeah uh, i appreciate uh and agree with uh commissioner schrader's comments and i i uh, the reason i raised the points i made earlier is and that and getting back to the bar and where the goalposts are um, I think the businesses need to know, um, and citizens need to know, we all need to know where the bar really is, uh, because if, if the bar is like we communicated that we all have to have greens on all the six indicators and we're tied to those other two counties, we have never, no county, no three counties have ever achieved all green bars in the metro region, ever will. So if that's the bar, then I think we need, then the state should come out right now and say, by the way, Metro Region, your businesses are never gonna go into phase two. I hope that's not the case, but that's how it's being perceived if we continue to message the way we're messaging. And I think that's the clarity we need. And I think we need to address that in a, in a letter to the governor coming from the board. Um, probably not a good time to craft that at this very moment, but I, I, that, that is my, that's why I raised those issues like I, like I raised them. Um, and I'll, you know, I, we just need the certainty. So my intention is this will be in discussion on Tuesday. Uh, I think we should reapply on, uh, discuss reapplying on Tuesday. 
Uh, and I think your point about we're never going to reach them as a region is very true. And uh, I, I've already told her that a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> but I think when in the form of a letter is a good idea. We are, you know, I, I, like I said before, I don't want to risk lives. Uh, so uh, there, the statistics are a little frightening, but I think we have to, again, if we have to reapply, even if we don't, I think we ought to ask. So, all right. Well, uh, Sonia. But I know you wanted to move on, Chair Bernard, but I went, I was in Lake Oswego last evening in sort of the Millennium Plaza looking at people and there are groups of young people that don't look like they're from the same family. They're all the same age. They're all walking around, not social distancing, hugging, not wearing masks. Groups of people everywhere out there. And if the public doesn't follow the governor's directive and recommendations of if you can't socially distance, even if you're outside, you need to wear a mask. Um, I think we really need to partner with our community and say, look, you gotta really help us with this because we risk going backwards. That's what I don't wanna see. I know our focus is, oh, we wanna move forward, but you know what, I don't wanna move backward. And I want us all to be thinking about how detrimental that would be if we all, if Clackamas County moved into phase two, but then oops, we gotta go back to phase one. Or like some places, oops, we gotta go back to phase zero. Um, Let's keep that in mind as policymakers as we make recommendations. Yeah, Washington County was going to do a media campaign. Uh, they asked if, if it was okay if they showed them here, and we said yes. I don't know. I haven't heard anything since then. They said they were going to pay for it, so hopefully that happens. Nancy? Yeah, they are working on that. Just to let you know, we actually had more information about that uh, just yesterday. So we're working and collaborating on that as well. I also just want to say, Commissioner Savas, we are going to go back and look at that data that you were talking about and make sure that we understand where that number is coming from and, and making sure we understand your concern there. And, and finally, before we move on, uh, you know, it, it is not up to us whether we open or not. It's up to people to follow the rules and stay healthy. It, we can't control it, the virus is controlling it. And we can't control whether we open until people start following the rules and stay healthy. So we gotta get that message across every day. And you know, I, it is getting better in Fred Myers. There isn't a person that goes into that place now that I've seen that isn't wearing a mask. That's probably not true everywhere. I live in Canby. It can be more challenging, but People seem to be following the rules. All right, so with that, Gary, what's on the list? All right, thank you, Nancy and Sarah, very much. Uh, we're moving on now, commissioners, to several public hearings. The first is board a board order accepting a request to transfer jurisdiction from Clackamas County to the city of Milwaukee for a portion of Monroe Street, County Roads number 2361, and Coon Road, County Roads number 1249. Kewen. Uh, uh, Mike Bays from Transportation and Development to present. And he's coming online here. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Bays. I represent the County <laughs> Department of Transportation and Development. Today we have before you a request to approve a board order for the transfer of jurisdiction of portions of Monroe Street and Kewen Road from Clackamas County to the city of Milwaukee. This request has been discussed by the staff of both jurisdictions. Clackamas County and the city of Milwaukee have agreed to the transfer of portions of Monroe Street and Kewen Road to the city with the intent of streamlining roadway improvements, eliminating confusion to the public, and to imp improve the efficiencies of maintenance and public service. The portions of Monroe Street and Kuhn Road to be transferred are located entirely within the Milwaukee city limits. Clackamas County has agreed to provide to the city of Milwaukee funds in the amount of $11,758, which is the equivalent of a two-inch overlay 
over the portion of Monroe Street to be transferred. The portion of Monroe Street to be transferred is approximately 422 feet long and contains approximately, approximately 17,000 square feet of right of way. The portion of Kuhn Road to be transferred is approximately 845 feet long and contains approximately 42,270 square feet of right of way. A notice for today's action was published for four consecutive weeks in the Clackamas Review. This request is consistent with the county's practice and policy of partnering with local jurisdictions to provide the necessary government services at the least cost for citizens. If there are any questions, I would be happy to respond. Are there any questions? Seeing none, uh, I will open the public hearing and turn it over to Dylan, who will moderate this portion. I'm sure there'll be big crowds. Thank you, Chair Bernard. Uh, I'm Dylan Blaylock with Public and Government Affairs. I'll be coordinating both public comment for the specific public hearings and later on for general comment. If any attendees would like to provide a comment specific to this public hearing, the transfer jurisdiction from the county to the city of Milwaukee of a portion of Monroe Street and Coon Road, um, you can do so now. I do see we have one hand up, but it has been up for several minutes. So if that individual does want to give a comment on this specific public hearing, just leave your hand up. I'll bring you in in a second. And I do not have any emails um, on this particular one, and there is no one on the phone. So uh, the, the handle is Ang Nyland. I will go ahead and bring you over now. Uh, Ang, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and then go ahead and keep your, please give your, your name, uh, your area of residence, and your comment specific to this uh, matter, the transfer. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's Ange, but Angela Nyland, oh. I live in Boring, and actually I've had my hand up since the COVID conversation, because oh. I did send in an email with questions regarding COVID and what the, commis the commissioners and the board are doing, so do I need to save my questions for later since? The, that would be open during, this is a specific public hearing that is uh, for the, the transfer of the road. We do have general comment coming up. That would be the right time to bring up matters involving COVID. And that will be- Okay, so that's while. later on on the call, yes. correct? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, so thank okay, you very great. much for that. Okay. I'll bring you over then. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no others, Chair. All right, we'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the board order accepting a request to transfer jurisdiction from Clackamas County to the city of Milwaukee of a portion of Monroe County, Monroe Street, County Road number 2361 and Kewen Road, <laughs> County Road number 1249. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the board order accepting request for transfer of jurisdiction. Clackamas County, City of Milwaukee, of a portion of Monroe Street, County Road number 2361, and Kuhn Road, County Road number 1249. Further discussion? All right, with that, um, I'll ask the clerk to please poll us. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Humberston? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. And Chair Bernard. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And the next item, Gary? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Next is also a public hearing board order approving the limited delegation of contract signing authority. Stephen Madcor, County Council, will present. Thank you, Gary. Morning, Commissioners. Stephen Madcor, County Council here. I have a board order for your consideration. And what this order does, it delegates contract signing authority to the procurement manager. As you know, the board delegates its contract signing authority to various county officials, department directors, county administration, county council. Currently, it's delegated that to the procurement division director. It's done by title, but that position no longer exists. It is procurement manager. That position is held by George Marlton. And this is basically a housekeeping um, board order change. And what it does, it would give specific contract signing authority to that position of procurement manager. It does not expand upon the scope of that authority, it is consistent with every other delegation that the board has previously delegated. 
and the board order would be um, infinite in terms of its duration, and it would be clarified later on when we revise the local contract review board rules. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Any questions? Seeing none, uh, I'll open the public hearing, hearing and turn it over to Dylan. All right, thank you again, Chair Bernard. If any attendees would like to provide a comment specific to this public hearing, approving the limited delegation of contract signing authority, you can do so now by utilizing the raise hand feature on Zoom. Again, we will open up public comment on any topic related to county business in a little while. Seeing none, Chair. Thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I lost my script, but I will move to approve. Is there a second? Second. You'll, thank you. You lost your script and you're sitting right there. <laughs> the dog took it. It, oh. it disappeared. I don't know what All happened. Right. It disappeared. <laughs> okay, it's been moved. We approve the board order approving the limited delegation of contract signing authority. Any further discussion? With that, please pull, clerk, uh, please pull the commission. Okay, Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner okay. Humberston. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. And Chair Bernard. Aye, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item is, thank you, uh, Stephen. Next item, Gary. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we're now moving to board discussion items. There are two. The first is resolution establishing Juneteenth as a county holiday. Um, I will present this, uh, commissioners, on uh, June 23rd, 2020, at your issue session. Uh, you did agree to bring forward to this meeting um, a proposal to declare Juneteenth a county holiday effective in the year 2021 and going forward. Uh, Juneteenth is uh, the oldest celebration commemorating the abolition of slavery in the United States. And this has been a request by many of our employees, including our employees of color, that why does Clackamas County not recognize Juneteenth as a recognized holiday? And the question is, uh, I don't know. And so we brought it forward to you and you agreed to discuss it today. If I may read the resolution, it's short, but it explains what Juneteenth is and why you do this. So uh, I will begin. Whereas Clackamas County acknowledges the discriminatory, traumatic, and generational harm caused by 400 years of slavery, whereas Juneteenth is the annual observation recognizing the Emancipation Proclamation, which occurred on January 1, 1863, but all remaining slaves in Texas did not receive the news until June 19, 1865. On this day, Juneteenth, 42 states in the United States, including the District of Columbia, commemorate the, abol the abolition of legal slavery, which gave all slaves freedom and equal rights. This day is also known as Freedom Day and Emancipation Day, and is honored by African American communities nationwide. Whereas Juneteenth is the oldest observed celebration commemorating the abolition of slavery in the United States today, which celebrates the freedom and achievement of African Americans. Whereas Clackamas County is committed to promoting racial healing, reconciliation, restoration, justice, and equitable opportunities for all people. Now, therefore, the Clackamas County Board of County Commissioners proclaims as follows, June 19th shall be a county holiday known as Juneteenth. The Board of County Commissioners encourages all residents, institutions, businesses and community groups to observe, observe Juneteenth as a day of remembrance and celebration. So commissioners, that is the proposal for you today to declare Juneteenth a county holiday beginning in the year 2021 and moving forward. Uh, do you have any questions? Any questions? No questions. Well, it's great that we're honoring this day. Uh, no, frankly, I didn't know much about Juneteenth until uh you know recently and uh, it's a shame <laughs> and so uh i'm honored to uh 
move this forward and celebrate uh, this great day uh, of the abolition of slavery in the United States and uh, Clackamas County's uh, commitment to uh, celebrate this day uh, in, the, in 2021 and, and, and there in the future. So with that, if there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the resolution establishing Juneteenth as a county holiday. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded Multiple at least seconds. twice <laughs> that we approve a resolution establishing Juneteenth as a county holiday. Any further discussion? Just like to comment, Mr. Chairman, that I think this is a long time coming. This recognition should have been done a long time ago. And I'm proud to be part of a county that is making this decision today. Thank you. With that, please pull the commission. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Humberston? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. And Chair Bernard? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. The next item, Gary. Thank you, commissioners, very much. And I thank Stephen Macor, who helped me draft the resolution, as well as our leaders in equity, diversity, and inclusion, our external advisory, your external advisory board, and our internal committee, equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. They all help work on this resolution. Uh, next is also a board discussion item uh, with the Department of Transportation and Development, approval of a memorandum of understanding and letter of commitment for the Get Moving Transportation Measure. We have Dan Johnson, Mike Besner, Jamie Stanzi from Transportation Development <laughs> to present. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, again, Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation Development. I'm joined by Mike Besner and Jamie Stasny from our group. Um, we are here to kind of re to request the board's authorization in um, approving some memor memorandums of understanding and letters of commitment related to the uh, Metro's Get Moving 2020 Transportation Funding Measure. Um, I guess one thing before uh, I turn it over to Jamie, um, just know the fact that we've worked uh, collaboratively with, with Metro uh, to adjust these documents to kind of meet the needs of, of to meet the needs and concerns of some of our commissioners. Uh, we've also adjusted these documents to meet the needs and concerns of our citizens uh, throughout the county. Um, I'll let you know that they are non-binding um, and that they essentially just established our roles and responsibilities if um, if this measure were to pass. So with that, Jamie, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, good morning, Chair Bernard, Commissioners, and Administrator Schmidt. Happy to be with you again. Uh, this is our third time coming back to the board. The first two were policy sessions, so we're happy to be here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can, oh, I'm not able to share my screen. Okay. We need to make you, uh, <laughs> make that available, uh, Mary. Sorry. Yep. We'll make you a co-host, Jamie. Just a second, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. If, if Mary or Christina could do that, please. Or Rich or Garrett or Dylan. They're you. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can go ahead and get started while we're getting through the technical challenges here. Um, since we were in front of you last week, as Dan stated, we have done a lot of work. Uh, we've gone back to our county council and had them review all of the documents. And we have worked very closely with our partners at Metro and our jur other jurisdictional partners to revise the MOUs um, to reflect those changes. Essentially, they're non-binding documents already, but we made it very clear in the documents that they're non-binding and that we would be coming back later to negotiate IGAs. So we removed some specific language. I'm still not able to share here. So uh, we removed some, oh, there we go. Yay. All right. So we did remove some specific language and I'll be happy to answer questions about that later on, but just wanna let you know, we've been doing a lot of work since last Thursday. So um, today we're back to present to you to talk through the letter of commitment and the MOUs that Metro is requesting that we sign. 
As we shared with you before, Metro is requesting um, these documents be signed by all partners in the measure. They are all non-binding agreements um, and IGAs and binding agreements will be negotiated and signed if the measure is referred, which is expected next Thursday, and also if it passes through um, the voters in November. So for us in Clackamas County, we have a letter of commitment that is broad that kind of encompasses all the projects that will fall within the boundaries of the county, just saying that we'll be good partners. These are, um, there is nothing in there other than saying if this measure passes and is supported, we will be good partners. We will make sure and support implementation of the investments that are planned in our county. So the letter of commitment is rather broad. And then we have two specific uh, MOUs and those are for 82nd and McLaughlin because there are many different jurisdictions that will be delivering projects on those corridors. And these documents affirm our intent to be good partners as I shared before, support implementation of the projects within the measure, and they reference specific project description sheets. So uh, just again for some context, this is corridor information for McLaughlin. McLaughlin corridor, there are 10 projects. So um, each of the projects has a specific project description sheet. An example of one on McLaughlin is the Trolley Trail project, the Trolley Trail Bridge project, which Clackamas County will be delivering. It talks about the project extents, delivery agencies, the budget and the project timeframe and has more description and mapping below. So there are many of these project description sheets within the measure. Um, a project description sheet that came up last Thursday uh, was for the enhanced transit. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Humbertson, you have your hand raised. Did you want to ask a question now? At the end of your presentation, will be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so this uh, project sheet came up. Uh, Commissioner Savas had some concerns about the extents of the McLaughlin Corridor ETC or Enhanced Transit Corridor project. Um, the extents or scope of the project was extended off of McLaughlin um, proper and, and all the way to Clackamas Community College and Clackamas Town Center. So we, as staff, have also been doing a, a lot of work with Metro staff and TriMet staff to understand when this changed, why it changed, what does it mean. Um, so just to be very clear, and, and I'll try and describe this to you, and then again, happy to answer questions later. Um, my understanding from Metro is that um, transit lines 33 and 99 exist in this corridor. And initially, when they were looking at this corridor for enhanced transit, they were just looking on McLaughlin itself. But after a lot more research and many more conversations, they realized that if they looked at the entirety of lines 33 and 99, this corridor became a very good candidate to get a federal match, which adds the level of investment, uh, raises the level of investment on this corridor, almost um, doubles it. So they wanted to make this uh, corridor a candidate for that opportunity. So that is why the corridor has been extended to match those transit lines. And also uh, you can see in the top, they're expecting 92.5 million from the measure to go into these projects. That could be matched by $87.5 million in additional federal funds. And we asked the question, and this came up during our policy session, if the $87.5 million in federal federal funds are not obtained, what will this corridor look like? Where will the $92.5 million be allocated? And the response we received from Metro staff is that the bulk of the funds will go just on McLaughlin proper. So the planned improvements that would be coming from the federal funds, which are essentially enhancement to transit stations, wider station platforms, bus pads, improved shelters, and real-time travel uh, displays, those would be shrunken essentially just to be on the, the McLaughlin, McLaughlin itself. So that the corridor would no longer be extended if, if we're not able to get that match. So that, those are the answers that we obtained from Metro staff and TriMet on this corridor. So moving on, um, Sunrise Corridor, as you all know, um, one of our top priorities. We uh, worked really hard on this corridor, which we've all talked about. There are four projects here including $180 million, which would be spent um, on the Highway 212 Complete Street project, and then also on Sunrise Planning and Design for the whole solution for the corridor. 
We also have the C2C corridor, which has many projects, but only one of which we will be delivering in Clackamas County, which is number seven, the new connector road. Um, and then we have 82nd Avenue, about 20% of that corridor is in Clackamas County. We would have a lot of ETC and safety improvements there as well. So um, I think that's all my updates. Oh, I had one more update and I should have said this on the McLaughlin sheet. There's been a bit of confusion about ETC versus BRT. So enhanced transit and bus rapid transit, excuse me. <clears throat> and they, those terms are used somewhat interchangeably and they have been throughout this process. We've been talking about these improvements as ETC. Metro um, started referring to them as BRT and I think that caused some confusion and we had some questions, especially from Commissioner Savas about that. Our understanding as we, we asked some questions around that is that they will be rebranding ETC as BRT. So enhanced transit becomes bus rapid transit, just meaning that they're moving people more efficiently in buses down these corridors. It's more of a familiarity and a branding approach for them. It's something similar to the system that they already have established on division, and they wanna be really consistent so folks can know what they can expect um, on these corridors. So just a, I guess, a, a rather weedy um, response, but just something that was important for us to, to understand better. So that is all I have for you today. We are here requesting your approval for signing these documents. Again, just a reminder, these are non-binding. These are specifically just saying, if the measure is referred and passes, we will be good partners and support these projects to ensure that the funds are implemented properly in the county. Thank you, Jamie and Ken. Yeah, I was unclear as to whether, at what point binding documents would have to be signed. Is that after the measure passes? That is correct. Those IGAs are going to be a, a big job to negotiate. And so they didn't want to get into all of that prior to knowing if, if we were going to have the funds or not. So yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, I was a little concerned because I wasn't sure if, if um, once it was referred, you'd have to have binding documents or if it was after it passes. After it passes to my knowledge. Okay, I'm good then, thank you. All right, Paul. Yeah, well, I really appreciate your work, Jamie, on this. I know that you've worked awfully hard and you have uh, been very dedicated. So I, I really appreciate your work and, and uh, all of our staff at DTD as it relates to this, this uh, effort and project. Um, I don't know which one to tackle first, but I'm just gonna ask everyone to indulge me a little bit because I think it's awfully important. So the, the I'll just take the BRT ETC language or, or acronym change. Um, you know, I, I'm less concerned if um, BRT is changed to ETC, but when we say that uh, we're gonna lump ETC and call it BRT. BRT's got a federal designation and a federal definition. And if it's gonna remain BRT, um, then I've, I've got a problem with that, um, you know, because it's not, again, it's not clear. We have to be clear. And I think we have to be honest. And I think what I got out of the work session when we last met as a board to talk about this um, I was trying to get clarity if this meant high capacity transit, if this meant a light rail study, and the answer was that it would be um, a, a light rail study as part of one of the alternatives of looking at this. So that's, that is a concern, I think, that we've got some previous um, voter input on, on how we navigate those permissions, if you will. Um, so that's one unsettling issue I have. Um, the other one is that in the MOU, and maybe it's easier for you to find, but in the MOU for whether it's 82nd or McLaughlin, there's some language in there, and I mentioned this before, uh, basically where there's one sentence in one of the dots where the, where the role agency roles are, and it says Metro is the agency referring the funding measure, so on, so on. But the last sentence says today in the packet, for approval. Metro generally leads planning for transit corridors and investment areas that require coordination with multiple agencies and community groups. And it goes on, you know, it goes on in, in other parts to define their role. Metro agrees to lead the transit corridor planning. Um, so what we're doing essentially 
if, if anyone wants to read that memorandum, um, uh, it basically, in, in, in essence, in my opinion, kind of abdicates our responsibility to do planning in Clackamas County. We are Clackamas County. Your department or DTD does transportation planning and land use planning. <clears throat> it's our role. And I have been less than satisfied, frankly, with the, the, the level of communication, consistency, and um, uh, just even the type of public involvement that they have done. So I'm not comfortable with giving um, sole, I mean, so much authority to another government that has not done a great job of representing Clackamas County to plan our both McLaughlin and 82nd Avenue. Um, that gives me great pause and great discomfort. So again, I think kind of, it, it feels to me like we're abdicating the responsibility that we ought to be doing. And if, if Metro had, has a history of doing great public involvement and, and engagement and having consistency, uh, it'd be a different, a different conversation, but that's not the case here. Um, the other one I'll, on the maps that you showed where it has the projects depicted, I, I raised this with, uh, Metro Councilor Lewis the other day had a good conversation. It, you know, when, when you look at any of those maps that you displayed and all the others that you didn't, it, it shows that, for example, Sunrise, it, it highlights Sunrise from I-205 all the way out and beyond to 172nd. But in reality, the project that's actually being funded for the most part for any kind of physical change or improvement is really a, an intersection, essentially. Um, and yet what's highlighted is the whole corridor. And the explanation was, well, we're gonna plan the corridor. Well, in reality, um, my question to staff maybe today is on, uh, we already built phase two. Um, Highway 212 has is, is already been improved up to 122nd. So why are we highlighting it all the way back to 205? Is there an, another project that needs to be planned between 122nd and I-205? That's a question. I, I could just jump in and answer that. I, I don't think so. I think the work on 212 itself, there might be some work west of um, 122nd, but uh, I don't, I think there's a little bit there with the future sunrise right at 122nd, because obviously instead of curving to meet 212, it'll go straight. And so that would all have to be re reworked, but pretty much the portion between 205 and 122nd on the sunrise main line stays pretty much the way it is. Yeah, I, I, my, my point, and thank you for that explanation. My point is that the, the maps and it, what's highlighted as where they're gonna invest in or whatnot is not an honest depiction of really what's being done. And you know, if we're gonna mix planning monies um, with construction monies, then we ought to display those in different colors and, and call them out separately. Because, and, that, and also, honestly, um, getting back to just even the one change that uh, Jamie was pointing out that that Metro made on us explaining that uh, the change on the McLaughlin corridor, you know, uh, that McLaughlin corridor was originally went north of Milwaukee. Okay, this change cuts off, cuts off that, that improvement from Harrison Street north. And so that's a change. And, and I know that when, when I pointed this out to you all, you were just as, as surprised about this as I was. And that's not anyone's fault, but it, it's another demonstration that Metro didn't really even reach out to us to talk to, talk to us about it. They're gonna, they're gonna shorten the project from, you know, and, and eliminate the, the part from Harrison North, and they're gonna add all, these, all this stuff, and they're not gonna even tell us. That doesn't give me the level of confidence or trust that I'm ready to sign, even as written, um, or suggest that we want to give them planning authority. Uh, I, I, I think our citizens are going to be the last to know um, and the first to pay. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a concern I have. Um, and lastly, I'll say this. You know, I, I, um, as some of my colleagues may have known, it, it, I'm sure it's probably public already, not that it's really been advertised out there, but the business groups in, in the region uh, apparently are circulating um, a letter to Metro in opposition of this project. And um, in reading some of the responses that I've seen in my inbox from people that were unhappy with that, 
there was uh, some in particular that pointed out, well, geez, this is going to this is going to eliminate any possibility for people to see traffic congestion reduced. And I, and I I, uh, I I thought that was a little bit odd because that was been one of my issues. Is it really doesn't do a lot for tr reducing traffic congestion in Clackamas County, um, and the projects that were it, we most desperately need it, this project does not, or this measure does not address that in any of these corridors. Um, and, and I think that one of the most important things is, and it's really a, a question we all have to ask ourselves on the board, is that, you know, for those citizens in Clackamas County who don't have any, other, although any alternative to drive their car because there is no transit available, does this reduce congestion for them? No. Does this um, increase their affordability in their neighborhoods if this project goes through? No. Um, does this offer any new transit lines where transit is desperately needed in Clackamas County? Anything? No, it doesn't. So I can't support it. it. It doesn't provide the benefits for the dollar that reduce traffic congestion or, or ensure affordability or offer new transit in areas where you don't have it. it. It doesn't do any of that. So that's my comments for today. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I, um, first off, I think that there are some benefits. I sat on this committee, worked through lots of meetings. Uh, it does increase safety. It does re increase reliability. Uh, it is needed in the county, uh, in the, in the within the metro area. It of course is needed all over the county. It's a it's a stimulus package, and this letter does not support it. It doesn't oppose it. It says if it passes, and frankly, I think the timing's not that good. Uh, if it passes, we're willing to work. To make this happen, I I don't think at all does this turn over the planning for McLaughlin Boulevard or 82nd Avenue to Metro. They don't own it. ODOT does, so ODOT will be doing the planning on that. And so um, it's up to the voters. I think it's only right that we ask them, and if they support it. We're here to make sure that Clackamas County gets what it deserves. If they don't, uh, then we don't have to worry about it. So um, um, I look forward to, uh, you know, having the opportunity to talk to the voters about this if they decide to put it on the, um, in November. So Sonia, you're up. Thank you. So, Jamie, I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. As I reviewed the documents, this is in preparation for if the measure passes, we are basically saying, yes, we're going to work with our partners around the region in planning and implementation of these projects that we um, really vetted in quite depth over the last, gosh, how long has it been, Jim? Has it been a year and a half? How long have we been yeah, working least. on this? Yeah, what was that? Yeah. And then the other, I just want to make sure that I have that frame correct. And then the other piece regarding the federal funds, if we have the opportunity to leverage local dollars with additional federal funds, please let's be mindful and thoughtful that that is a very good thing for our infrastructure and we need improvements. And we also need to be mindful that we are in a, we're, we may not be quite yet, but we're headed for a recession and the way you get out of a recession is to um, build your way out, basically. You need economic stimulus, and this is important, important projects. Now, if it passes, I don't know. We're not voting today saying we're endorsing the Get Moving 2020 measure. That'll be a conversation for another day. I just want to make sure that my vote is saying we're committing, if this passes, to work with our regional partners on the projects that we vetted. Exactly what it's Jamie said. Faith shaking her head yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you. Well, I'm good to go. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. You've done excellent work on this. All right, Paul, let's finish this up. Sure. Well, I just want to just point out 
exactly what it says is what's printed in the packet. All right. And that's not consistent with what you've all just said. I'll just point that out. It's not what I read. You want to point that out specifically where this says that, yeah, we're supporting this measure? You're on mute, Paul. I'm, I'm happy to read again what it says in the MOU. Um, let me open it up again. Uh, one of the one of the lines Metro agrees to lead transit corridor planning. Lead it says lead. If the if the if the enhanced transit improvements are partially funded through the FTA CIG program, Metro will lead planning to a preferred alternative and complete environmental review. It says lead. Well, that's always what they do with transportation, meaning they have the meetings, they coordinate uh, having the meetings with the community. It's not saying they're going to be leading the development of the project. And it's not saying we support the measure. You're not, I don't know. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll make the motion. Thanks. I move we approve a memorandum of understanding and a letter of commitment for get moving transportation measure. Is there a second? I'll second. Sonia seconded it. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I just want to reiterate uh, Commissioner Fisher's uh, observations, and that is this is absolutely a non-committal memorandum of understanding. When the time comes, if this does pass, if the voters say okay, then that is the time for what I would guess I would call hardball negotiations about what what gets done and who's in control, etc. Right now, there is no binding commitment on us at all. So yeah, I'm fine with that. It specifically says that on the bottom of the yep. uh, letter. All right, uh, please poll us. Okay, Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Humberston. Aye. Commissioner Savas. No. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Chair Bernard. Aye, motion carries. Thank you guys very much for your uh, efforts, your time, and outstanding service to the community of Clackamas County. Thank you. Thank you. The next item, Gary, is? Consent agenda. Okay. I'll ask the clerk to read the consent agenda. Okay. Today's consent agenda. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of Amendment Number Three to the Intergovernmental Subrecipient Agreement with Foothills Community Church, Malala Adult Community Center, to provide Older Americans Act services for Clackamas County residents. Approval of Amendment Number Three to the Intergovernmental Subrecipient Agreement with the City of Sandy Senior and Community Center to provide Older American Act services for Clackamas County residents. Approval of Amendment Number Three to the Intergovernmental Subrecipient Agreement with Friends of Estacada Community Center to provide Older American Act services for Clackamas County residents. Approval of Amendment Number Three to the Intergovernmental Subrecipient Agreement with the City of Wilsonville Community Center to provide Older American Act services for Clackamas County residents. Approval of Intergovernmental Agreement Number One Six Zero Four Five. Three, amendment number one to the State of Oregon Department of Human Services, Aging and People with Disabilities for the provision of no wrong door services to Clackamas County residents. Approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement, amendment number three with LifeWorks Northwest to provide relief nursery services in Clackamas County. 
approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement amendment number one with Toto Hutos to provide kindergarten readiness partnership and innovation services, approval of a local grant local subrecipient grant agreement with Northwest Family Services for children of incarcerated parents and parenting inside out services, approval of an intergovernmental agreement number one with Oregon City School District to provide kindergarten readiness partnership and innovation services, approval of a local subrecipient grant with Clackamas Women Services for shelter advocacy and crisis domestic violence services, approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement with Clackamas County Children's Commission to provide a Help Me Grow liaison, approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement number one with Immigration and Refugees Community to provide kindergarten readiness partnership and innovation services, under our Department of Transportation and Development, approval of a contract with Harper Huff Peterson Regillis for the Lolo Pass st 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 Stabilization and Surface Preservation. Under administration, we have approval of a revised amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon related to funding for future county courthouse. Under technology services, approval of service level agreement between Clackamas Broadband Exchange and the Park Academy for dark fiber connection. Approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the state of Oregon Department of Administrative Services for the Albert Security Monitoring. Uh, approval of a service level agreement with Clackamas County Technology Services and Clackamas 800 Radio Group for dark fiber connection. Under Community Corrections, approval of an intergovernmental agreement number 5834, amendment number one, with the State of Oregon Department of Corrections, reflecting the decrease in inmate welfare funds for fiscal year 2020-2021. Under Disaster Management, approval to apply for fiscal year 2020 emergency management performance grant between Clackamas County and the State of Oregon. And that concludes this long consent agenda. Thank you, Mary. And with that, I will entertain a motion. Or wait, does anyone wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? <laughs> Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded that we approve, approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mary, please poll us. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Humberston? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. And Chair Bernard? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And Gary, next is County Administrator Update. Will you please bring the County Administrator on? Oh, wait, you're there. The first is public communication. We'll let uh, Dylan. Oh, oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, first is public communication, and I'm going to turn it over to Dylan, and he's going to bring people on. And I saw yeah. that uh, we still have one person waiting. Yes, thank you very much, Chair Bernard. This is the time of the meeting for general comment related to any county issue. If any attendees would like to provide a comment, you can do so now by utilizing the raise hand feature on Zoom if you're on the phone, but we don't have anybody on the phone for this one. Uh, and Chair, I do have at least one comment that has come in through email. So um, okay. I'm just gonna double check Angela, if you're still there, I see you there, but I don't see your hand raised. So please raise your hand just so I know, there we go. I will bring you over now. Great, so Angela, if you are there, if you could unmute yourself, provide your name, your area of residence, and keep your comments under three minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Angela Nyland. I live in Boring, I'm right by Guide Dogs for the Blind. And um, we, my questions are related to COVID and how the county is, you know, how we're, working to get out of this mess. Um, first, for the contact tracing now, I would expect that people wouldn't be able to get contacted during a holiday week, and maybe that's why people didn't answer the phone. Um, but also, do we have enough contact tracers 
also our percentages um, don't remain high. Is there more that needs to be hired? I mean, do we have everybody? And if we don't have everybody, what is the ETA to have those people on board? And then my other question, because some of my questions from my email have been answered on this call already. Um, since Washington County does not want to be tethered either with us or Multnomah County, is there someone from the board that is working with Washington County um, to, so there be a united front when um, dealing with the governor that, you know, two out of the three, I haven't heard what Multnomah County wants, but um, can we get a united front going, you know, that two out of the three, uh, Multnomah County has so much going on in it right now that um, I'm not sure if the tracers are even asking if people have been in a large mass gathering. Um, leave protest and riot words out of there, just large gatherings. Because um, that may, and I think it will help if the governor shows a more equal front on masks and large gatherings. Uh, just an example, the fireworks were canceled in Salem due to COVID, but yet the next announcement right after that is be prepared for a thousand people that are coming to march on the same day at the Capitol. And it just doesn't seem, you know, if if we can't get together for fireworks in Salem, then they shouldn't have a permit to get to the Capitol to have a, ma a mass gathering in block roads. It seems like it's not equal across the board. And I think if it was more equal across the board, more people would buy into wearing masks. All Thank you. All right, so thank you, you're welcome. Uh, let me, I can answer, I think, all of these. One thing is we, are, we have enough uh, tracers now Lost you, Jim. Uh -oh. Yeah, his uh, signal is frozen. Hmm. What would any hmm, would any uh, other commissioners like to step in to answer um, or not? Or we could wait for Chair to come back. I do have another comment I can read. I'll make, but Gary, I'll make one comment that we can't contact trace the community spread and the community spread is increasing. So somebody just ends up with the virus and you can't con you can't figure out where it came from is, is a challenge. And that's one of the um, criteria that we're looking at. So that's part of the answer. I don't know what Jim was going to say about the number of contact tracers. I believe we do have the capacity that we need in Clackamas County. Gary, is that correct? Yes, we do. Are they still in training? The contact tracers? Yes. Uh, you know, as we bring in new people, there's a small amount of training, so it's kind of a revolving process, but we have enough people who have been trained and are ready doing that work that is occurring today. Could we use more? Of course. We could always use more, but we do have a stable amount of, for what we need right now in Clackamas County. Well, we're waiting for for um, Commissioner Bernard. Do we know? Are we asking? You know, when we do get somebody on the phone, are we asking? Have you been in any large outdoor gatherings? Because there are large outdoor gatherings going on all over the place. I guess if no one has the answer, then I guess maybe we should get an answer. So, um, and, and uh, we have your email address, Angela. So let's find the, find her an answer and reply back. Um, I, I do want to make one comment um, as regard to the amount of tracers, which I don't clearly know as of yet. Uh, you did someone did touch on it. Maybe that was Gary, but um, as I heard, I think it was Dr. Present say that um, in the effort to reach out to some of those people, you know, they had a lot going on. So it, se it seemed to me that there was a message there, maybe that they had a lot of work to do and they couldn't pursue making those phone calls. So I guess the question 
some assurances that we actually have adequate staffing um, to do the contact tracing and we have met our required number. Th those, are, those are affirmations I'd like to have uh, for clarity to make sure because frankly, if we really wanna stop the spread, we need to get as many people notified and understand where, where it's been spread to. And I think we need to be a little bit more tenacious, if you will, um, in trying to seek out those contacts um, the other question I, I have, and I don't have anyone, I don't expect anyone to answer this today because Dr. President's not here, but she mentioned today um, uh, about some of the cases, uh, a growing number of cases being sporadic. And, and I, I don't think that all cases that are sporadic in her definition are necessarily um, untraceable. They ought to be traceable. I, I, just take, I just thought that the contents of sporadic meant that they're not tied to a family or they're not tied to a congregate housing, but they still could be social or they could be, I went to a store here or so on. And, and I, I'd like better definition of what sporadic means. Um, and that's a question for probably next week. All right, nope, go ahead. Uh, if I may, so there appears to be some sort of an internet connection outage at the county. So any of our commissioners or staff who are at the county are gone on this meeting. So Mark, Commissioner Schrader, you are now the chair of the meeting. Uh, so we'll, we'll finish up as best we can with those of us remaining. Well, I didn't apologize because I have barking dogs, okay? They were quiet for a while. So I'm taking over the chair when they're starting to get antsy. So hopefully we can, we can move ahead here. So where are we, Gary, in this? We've got um, Commissioner, no, we've got actually, you're going to do your communication piece. Right, we're still in public oh. communication. So oh, public communication, any anybody there? else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, can I, yes. oh. Chair, can I just comment to one other thing that Angela had mentioned, which was a real concern of mine regarding permits for protests and mass gatherings when other mass gatherings are prohibited and that concern. And during one of our policy sessions, I had asked um, Stephen, I wish he was on the call, but I guess our lawyer isn't there, isn't on our meeting because he got pumped off as well, I'm sure. But I was wanting to know if when someone does get a permit for a mass gathering, if you could require masks and social distancing mm -hmm. and Stephen had said no because of um, constitutional considerations but I did want to let Angela know I've been watching this very very carefully and communicating with Oregon health authorities I've been very concerned about spike in cases due to the protests and also um, disproportionate testing availability potentially for people of color because people of color have been disproportionately affected by COVID. The numbers are very, very clear. But as of now, the information that I've received is there has not been an increase in cases due to the protests. And if you, I've watched as much as I can the protests and on TV, people are wearing masks at the protests. There's been a lot of public outreach to get that education to people who are protesting. And that is a really good indicator of what we can do as we reopen our, our economy and move forward is to wear masks. So that's the latest information that I have and continue to watch it carefully. Okay, yes, uh, Ken. So um, in asking questions of, of uh, Nancy Bush, uh, one of the questions I asked was, do they ask questions about mass gatherings? I believe they do, but we have to keep in mind that people cannot be compelled to answer questions. So uh, that's one of the things that Dr. Pleasant uh, actually referred to in her presentation earlier today. Uh, there are people who simply refuse to answer the door or refuse to answer certain questions, uh, which obviously does affect the tracing aspect of, of what we're trying to do. Um, some people unfortunately view it as, as an invasion of privacy. Um, and, and that is a more important issue to them than public health, unfortunately. So it, it's complicated. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think the tracing aspect of it, especially when we're talking community spread as opposed to uh, institutional spread or business spread, where you can actually monitor people, um, makes, makes it difficult to hold us to, to the uh, tracing statistic um, 
as as part of our request to reopen. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, commissioners, any other comments for Angela? I just okay. want to say thank you, Angela, for emailing your questions. I received those before the meeting. I had time to think about them. I appreciate Commissioner Schrader then forwarding them again. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Mm -hmm. And this is how we have good dialogue and good conversation. So very appreciated. And let's keep the conversation going. Okay. 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 Dylan, do we have anyone else? We, uh, we do, Commissioner Schrader. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank uh, Angela for that. Okay. And I also want to thank, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Savas for mentioning that we do have Angela's email address. Good. I had forgotten yeah. about that. So thank you very much. Uh, Dylan, we have one comment that is... Dylan, sorry, can you check with Ange to see if she had another comment? Because her hand is still raised. Please. Oh, is her yeah. hand still raised, Angela? Let me bring, so. let me bring her, yep, okay. Sorry, let me bring her back over. Angela, go ahead. Thank you. I just have one follow-up question. Do we know, um, my understanding is the age groups for our newer cases is oh, yeah. lower in like the 20s and 30 age range. I'm old, so, you know, but <laughs> I call them kids um, that are in the 20s and 30s. Do we know if of the ones that are responding, to the tracing, you know, I you know completely understand somebody refusing to answer questions, but of the of those that are in that age range, are they responding to the questions? Because um, oddly enough, I've heard of course Facebook and social media has so much stuff on it. There's actually COVID parties where younger folks are getting together and actually betting to see who gets COVID from these mass parties. Kind of weird. But I'm just wondering if our, uh, are we getting any statistics for the younger people that are now their cases are growing? Thank you. Could, could we direct that question over to the EOC for an answer? I don't think. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. That would be great. I'd appreciate it. And, and I would also say you can check the, uh, I believe the Oregon Health Authority's website would have some of that information as well, I think. I know well, I I've been on their website yeah. and it's kind of not as informative as through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know your feeling. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Welcome to our world, Angela. Yeah, I, I hear you. Seriously. Um, I don't know. I have heard the same thing. And I do know that here locally. I'm going to Okay. Uh, locally in my hometown, um, I know that Commissioner Fisher mentioned this, that in particular, we are seeing a lot of young, young folks who, I, I really don't know, my kids aren't teenagers anymore. I don't know how you enforce that with teenagers at this point in time. Um, but we're seeing a lot of young people who, um, are still in the stage of their life where they, you know, consider themselves immortal, um, as opposed to those of us who are a little on in our years. So, anyway. All right. So, so Jim, I'm going to hand it back to you as chair. Yay. All right, Dylan, anybody else? Yes, chair. Uh, we have had one uh, comment come in over email, so I will go ahead and read that now. This is from uh, Les Poole in Gladstone. Many county officials and residents are aware that Clackamas has frequently been overlooked or treated unfairly by state agencies in the past. Major decisions involving transportation, land use, and grant funding have been made without adequate consideration. The pattern is repeating, and this time our health is at risk. There are many troubling aspects to the state's response to the COVID-19 virus. The lack of consistent information and specious mandates by the governor have taken a toll. Vague requirements for face coverings, changing methodology for reporting, and favoritism have continued the pattern. After receiving hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars from the federal government, the governor immediately sent money to Multnomah and Washington counties. Clackamas and others were not provided a single dollar. The lack of deserved financial relief has damaged the financial health of the businesses and residents alike. As millions flowed elsewhere, we were informed that CARES funds were not coming to Clackamas and that reopening the county was dependent on a five-county region, including <laughs> Clackamas, 
Columbia, <laughs> Multnomah, and Washington. As our frustration and plight have grown, the governor responded by moving the bar once again. Commissioner Savas has been the most outspoken, and during the June 25th meeting, others joined him, including Commissioner Schrader, who expressed outrage over the latest obstacles placed in our path. Prior to the meeting, the governor finally approved CARES funds for Clackamas, but included restrictions and requirements that were not imposed on counties that have already received funds. On behalf of thousands, I request that county leadership demand fairness and consistency from the state, specifically Governor Brown. We are suffering greatly as the governor has proven to be unreliable and has shown a glaring political bias when dealing with Clackamas and other counties. Our waning, our waning trust has been stretched beyond reasonable limits. Thank you, Les Poole Gladstone. Well, okay. uh, one response I can give you, uh, and be short, is the federal government gave the money to populations over 500,000. That would be Multnomah, Washington, and uh, the city of Portland. That's it. That's the rules. And then to say we haven't got a single dime is not true. You just mentioned it. Uh, and boy, I can tell you that every time I've talked to her, we've asked for more money. We've asked to reduce the requirements. We've done everything to try and get some of that money up and we're not done asking. I'm just hoping they don't run out before we have a chance to get some of it. We do have an application for over 5 million in. I believe we have another close to $3 million application. I think I met, Nancy mentioned it yesterday. So uh, I agree that uh, I think the required restrictions are tougher to us and they're greater than required by the federal government. I don't think that's fair. All right, so uh, that's it, Dylan. Uh, I see no other hands raised, but I see some hands raised from the commissioners yeah. chair. I see yeah, some. I'm gonna ask them after we ejected the citizen. Uh, Paul and then Martha. Yeah, my only, my response is basically um, that um, at, as the CARES Act uh, spells out that that money is supposed to be apportioned to the counties and that has not happened. Uh, we've been, you know, billing uh, the state for those those expenditures that we've made, but we have not had the liberty as the other counties to provide the funding um, to to Clackamas County businesses or, or uh, residents to that matter. And it's very interesting how Washington County, by the way, just for people who just may, may not know this, Washington County um, shared some of that funding with Wilsonville. And Wilsonville, portion of Wilsonville is in Washington County. So Wilsonville was, it was able to receive CARES Act funding and they were able to help uh, and do, do help businesses and um, economic uh, recovery act activities um, in, in Wilsonville. Um, but what, what do we have over here to do that? Nothing. So I think the point of whether it's the person who made the email or our conversation today or our conversation in the past. You know, whatever we're doing in, in, in the conversation with the governor, Chair Bernard, it ain't working. You have another idea? Uh, I, I, I think we ought to build, be building alliances with other counties um, and, and speaking as one voice and um, uh, be, be consistent and ask for consistency. All right, Martha. Microphone. It isn't just Clackness County. Um, really, across the state, uh, it's really kind. Of, it's been inequitable in terms of the other prescriptive things that the state is putting uh, in our pathway. And I get concerned because um, the whole notion of regionalism. Really, I'll talk a little bit about this later. Really, does not include a good portion of our county. All right. I mean, I had an impact meeting last night that I'll talk about later, and uh, it's become very clear to me. Hey, stop! Sorry, barking dog. Um, it's become very, very clear to me that I don't know where the lack of trust 
from our, our governor's office comes from as the Association of Oregon Counties is trying to work through this with them. But they do not trust the counties to, to fill, in my mind, to fulfill the obligations that are necessary. Um, and they really don't have much respect for um, the local community's ability across the state to handle this. I, I think that's I think that's one of the problems with the mask issue too. I, I think there's a total, I think there's mutual lack of trust between the governor's office and the rest of the state. But that's just my opinion. So I agree with your dog too, Martha. Your dog is entirely right and right isn't, on point. Isn't she? Isn't she the most annoying little <coughs> monster? I have to tell you, it's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, all right. All right. Anything else, Dylan? Anybody else? No chair. No hands. All right. Great. Thank you very much. And now our administrator, Gary Smith. 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 Yvonne, it's up to you. You can call me anything you want. All right. So uh, uh, administrator update. First, I'll share some good news and then we'll review the uh, join document uh, for you. First, some good news. Clackamas County Dog Services continues to successfully reunite stray dogs with their owners. Our staff recently received a note of thanks from a member of the public who uh, is a relieved puppy parent who was reunited with her lost dog. Uh, this person said she really appreciated the great care that our staff took with her dog after her dog, Piper, escaped. Uh, this person also says she really appreciated our staff's social distancing <coughs> procedures, which made sure that everyone was safe while this person was reunited with her dog. So thank you to our dog services team for their excellent service. Um, second, uh, uh, we have received positive news to our North Clackamas Parks and Recreation staff for their maintenance of Altamont Park. Um, and a, a resident wrote, uh, we recently moved into a house near Altamont Park and we've been enjoying the park. The, the enthusiasm for fireworks on the 4th of July was unbelievable, and I expected Sunday morning there would be quite a mess at the park. We were pleasantly surprised that your crews had already been there the next morning and cleaned up everything thoroughly. The grounds were clean and all the garbage cans were empty. We were very impressed with the good work of your staff. So thank you to our North Clackamas Parks and Recreation staff. That's the good news I'd like to share. Next, I'd like to use my time here uh, to have a discussion with you board on a follow-up to your policy session this Tuesday on the protest response, divest and invest policy prognoses. Our staff worked diligently to provide answers to all of the categories um, in that document. We sent that document to you uh, last evening. And now is the chance for you to finalize any comments or feedback you need so that Commissioners Fisher and Savas have what you need for this meeting, which will occur tomorrow, Will you will share these results with the group. Uh, so I would like to ask if you could please bring uh, Drenda into the meeting room, please. Um, and then uh, if I'll leave it at that. I don't plan on going over the document line by line, but rather, Commissioners, do you have any comments, questions, anything that is unclear that you need a resolution before tomorrow? Hello, commissioners. We also Hi. have Rich Swift in the waiting room. Gary, if you want to bring him in. Oh, he's back, yes. Uh, if we could bring in Rich Swift, please, also, just to answer any questions. And thank you to uh, Rich and Jill and Drenda and Christina McMahon, who all put this together uh, very quickly since Tuesday. All right, Chair, there's two commissioners who have their hands raised. I thought, oh, so we're not going to, we're just going to go to the questions. Okay. Commissioner Fisher. Um, I had some questions and I got them to Drenda. I don't know, Gary, if you saw them. I did, yes. Okay, good. So I'll just go through some suggested edits or clarifications I would like before the meeting tomorrow. And the first one, there's a request for a black recovery and relief fund and i would instead of saying that we need funding i would rather say that we are working with state partners for a dedicated funding source just the way that it's worded um and also 
if Rich could answer, I appreciate the depth that is in the notes, but if Paul and I are going to speak to these, I would like more information on what we're doing on culturally specific mental health and also culturally appropriate maternal health. And if, if the commission is okay with that, I can get that information offline just so, or Paul and I can do an afternoon meeting with um, our staff just to get some more so we're prepared. And, yes. then, and then there was um, a comment about canceling rent. And while we don't have the um, legal authority to cancel rent, I do know that we have some rent relief funds. Our county just sent out a CLATCO news about rent assistance due to COVID. And what I would prefer to say, instead of saying that we're working, that the commission needs to decide if they're gonna advocate for that with the legislature, is I would prefer to say that we are currently implementing COVID relief, which we will continue to consider advocacy for. When we get the funding for Here Together, 25% of that, I believe it's 25%, I might be wrong on that, but I think it's 25% is exactly for rent subsidies. So I think we're gonna be able to get there and I don't wanna just to punt on that one. And then my last comments, um, oh, there were two other comments. I don't know what we're doing in regards to sweeps. And so I'm concerned about committing to that as the county commission, because that's really the sheriff. And then lastly, the public benefits program on the list that was provided to us said that we are doing that, but we may not be able to do that. So it's kind of in process. I don't want us to overcommit what we're saying we're going to do if we're not sure we're going to be able to. So those are my comments. I don't know if anybody else wants to just weigh in or allow Paul and I to work this out offline is fine with me. All right, Ken and then Paul. I'm fine with them working it out offline. Uh, I just had one question, and that is when when is uh, it when is it appropriate to make uh, that list public? Um, is that something we want to do now or at, uh, after you've uh, finished your discussions? Is it public now? Our list is public now. I mean, what you from your work session? packet on Tuesday that was posted online. Okay. So there's no problem with with post, posting it uh, more broadly online so that people can see what we what you're working on on our behalf. Yeah, uh, I think that we're I'm sorry Brenda for stepping in but I think that uh, transparency and and is really important. So I had never thought that this was not, from Clackamas County's perspective, transparent. For sure. That's my perception. Paul, I don't know, you want to weigh in on that with me? Well, let's, well let's yeah, I, I think it's important, number one, to say that, um, you know, obviously any anything that comes in is, is public, but on that very topic, um, in, the, in regard to the memo that, um, uh, Rich's department put together. I would, if that's the case, then I would certainly want you to, to um, clearly articulate that those those items that we're addressing, the verbiage that came that did not come from us is articulated as coming from that organization. That those aren't our words. Then this is our response to their. So that it's not clear because the the type. The font and the color are all the same, and it looks like it's our language when it's not really our language. So I think our language should be very clear. Uh, Sonia did touch on a couple of things that I, I spotted in there as well. I just want to add, um, I'm if the boards, if, if, if in concept you're okay with a lot of that, let Sonia and I um, hash out the details today um, and make a few clarifications, one of which um, is that we ought to clearly depict what is going to be um, state funded uh, or we're going to rely on state funding. Um, an example of that, and I really, and I do appreciate, Rich, this one point on the rents or, you know, uh, is that there's a line in there to help make the landlords whole. So I appreciate that language in there, and I think that's fair, that's consistent with our policy. Mm -hmm. However, we don't have the pocketbook to do that. 
And I think we ought to be clear. And that, that, those are the small, edit, um, small little edits I want to make in there that we're going to rely on state funding. And we, we can't, we don't have anywhere near the amount of money, any money to do any of that with. So uh, I just have a few edits like that. I don't think I want to get in the weeds yeah. right now on, but I think Sonia and I and Drenda, uh, Gary and Rich, if necessary, uh, can help uh, finalize that. And then not really talk about it tomorrow. Our job is actually to insert it in a spreadsheet because they're very quick and we don't have time to talk through all of that. So we need to insert it in, in the spreadsheet um, oh, in their format. So I, I, I agree with the transparency. I just viewed it as a working document and I wasn't sure when you were ready to be more broadly publicizing it. So if you can get something out to the rest of us that uh, reflects the issues that you have raised, Paul, uh, and the language that you think is appropriate, I'd appreciate that. Um, Cause I think, I do believe that people need to know what, what we're working on and what we have accomplished. Um, right, and right. And, and, where, and, and, and exactly, and I'm happy to do that. It is a draft. And it's a work. It's a work in progress that will be finalized here uh, by the end of the day. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Martha. Um, my questions have been answered. It's okay. Thank right. you, Ken. Right. All right. So you guys got uh, work ahead of you this afternoon. Have fun, Gary. What else you got? Uh, that is the end of my report. Thank you, Chair. All right. Tim, can uh, I just? Can I just yes. butt in just really quick? Cause I just want to make sure we've got this because Paul and I, as the commission's representative from the rest of your perspective of reviewing the document, you're good with all of those commitments that Clackamas County is making. I mean, a lot are in Gary's wheelhouse, the ones that we're saying that they will be completed, but I just want to make sure that everybody has reviewed that and everybody's good with it. I'm good with it, except I want to soften some of them um, after consultation, but I'm good with it. I just want to make sure we're all good because I, we, Paul and I can't commit the county without the well, board's approval. I don't I think we can commit without seeing it. And if that's right, that's one, right. one area of commitment that you're talking about is uh, funding the sheriff's department. I, I don't know. You could say, well, we're going to cut 10 million. I know you're not. And tell them that I'm I'm not committing to cut ten. No, 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 Jim. It was in the document that Drenda sent last night. Yeah. That said what will happen, what's likely to happen. It's that it's it's those specific commitments. Well, I think you you have to do what Paul said. This is a draft, and this has not been the final draft. Did not go before the board, but generally we're supportive of everything that we're looking at but well i think if you if the commission says yes we are supportive of the draft if we have if paul and i have that commitment then we can work with gary and rich i mean just to clarify some things but that's the kind of direction that i think paul and i need in stepping into that meeting tomorrow well i think we can say we're supportive of the draft i would agree with Jim, I think that's a safe way to go. I've been concerned all along. I have with intent not attended those meetings because I didn't want to break uh, quorum rules as basically advised by our uh, county council. And um, I don't still, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not clear whether or not those meetings are public. My assumption is that they're not public meetings right now, but, and nothing has been made public until now. Because that, I haven't seen minutes. I haven't had. I, I, I don't know if they're recorded. I don't know. So, um, I, I guess that's that's still kind of an issue. So, if this is a draft, I'm okay with it. But I don't think we're ready to go public with it un until we see the final document. Well, I think what will happen tomorrow is that what is in that draft is going to be in a document that will become public because there's going to be a apparent press conference with the commitment from all of the different jurisdictions. So it's important for the board to look at that and make sure that everyone's okay with, and staff did an excellent job. I mean, I really was impressed with what the 
what they did, we as the board need to say, yes, this is what we are committing to in Clackamas County. So if, if I can, I, I, I think it's, I want to reframe what I said earlier. I, it's my suggestion that Sonia, myself, the administrator and Rich and Drenda uh, work out the details and, 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 and work on the language a little bit. It is a draft, in my opinion. Uh, we can't make financial commitments we can't afford. I, want to make, I think Gary has said that before. And I think we need to delineate what we think is going to be state funded or otherwise, things that are policy oriented. Um, you know, that might be a staff commitment time and I need Gary and Rich's uh, ideas around, do we have the capacity to do that? And so if you're okay and comfortable with us trying to put that in there and insert that in there and, and, and get, that, get, get that and get agreement if the, if the five of us, again, staff, Gary, Rich, and Drenda, uh, Sonia and I, um, can get there, then we can put it in there. If we, if we feel that's something we can't commit to, then we'll just put language in there that we're attempting, or that's our intent. Um, and we can make that very clear that if it's not necessarily a commitment, um, it might be an effort, an ongoing effort. There, there's language in there to, to, to give uh, flexibility. <laughs> okay, Ken? So Gary, what would you suggest as our process from here can we have general consensus that everyone's okay with the draft? Paul and I work, we get something done with just a little bit more clarity to that draft document, get that out to everyone. And if anybody has any additional feedback, they get that directly to you before tomorrow's meeting. Does that work? You're asking me? Yes, that, that look. So commissioners, uh, it, uh, you need to empower Commissioner Savas and Fisher to make a commitment on behalf of the county tomorrow. This will be going public, All right. the press mm -hmm. conference, yep. of what each organization is doing, and then you will be held accountable. We will be held accountable to achieving it. Right. Uh, uh, th this is this is policy, but it's also political, right? Policy-wise, these are worthwhile efforts to engage with and that we as a county need to have a position on and to show some advancement. I will offer that as a policy. This is also politics. This costs money. In many cases, this uh, adds, uh, uh, this con not conflicts, but it adds to your strategic plan, which you've already addressed. I, I don't mean to sound like a bureaucrat, but I'm going to. You're, you're, you're putting more response, you're giving more, you're asking staff to do more for you, and there's limited capacity. So what truly are your priorities with the 12 priorities you've already set as a board? Pre-COVID, pre-Black Lives Matter, granted, but this is a commitment you'll be making on these various um, policy perspectives. Worthwhile, absolutely. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but whatever Commissioners Fisher and Sav or uh, Savis and Fisher say tomorrow, that is a commitment for the organization. I'm not saying you step back; you can't. Uh, but be very clear: what is said tomorrow will be committing the county. Mm -hmm. So, I can't tell you how many. I got to make sure. I can't tell you how many times we've got to this point and people weren't comfortable with going the distance without referring back, even the most basic letter. I mean, I'm committed to the general idea, but to the specifics, I don't know what they're gonna be when you're done without looking at it. So I mean- So Jim, if you're comfortable, I don't think we will go more if anything will lessen things in my mind, but we're not gonna go to more of a commitment than what is in the draft document. So if you're okay reading that and saying you're okay with what was drafted with those commitments, I think that if the commission says that they're okay with that, with the draft document, then that will give us the authority we need to to clarify some things. And we could get it out to you by the end of the day as well. Good, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, maybe saying it this way will be helpful. I don't know, but I read the document and I agree pretty much with everything in that document in principle, contingent upon funding sources. Yep. It's really that basic. There's nothing in principle in there that I would disagree with. Uh, and there are issues that, that are consistent with our our overall goals as a county. But obviously, implementation is contingent upon funding. So that would be my caveat. I, 
and that's my position. Thank you. Yeah, I think a statement in the beginning that in principle, the Board of County Commissioners supports the, the document, uh, Paul. Yeah, I just wanna say that, um, I wanna just modify one thing. Um, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, but Gary said something, and I don't think it's what, what Sonia and I are gonna agree to tomorrow. It's what we're gonna agree to today um, for tomorrow. And that's got a, um, that's got a couple of opportunities in there. Number one, by the end of the day, you'll have a, a completed document or draft. And two, it'll be something that Sonia and I agree on. If we can't agree on it, we'll have to find or buffer the language that we find agreement on. Um, because I don't, if we're at an, if Sonia and I are at an impasse on something, then I, I don't think it's fair for us to include it. But um, we got to get it inserted in the spreadsheet before the meeting tomorrow. We can't do it on the fly. There's just no time to do that. Um, but there is time to get that completed today. And um, I don't think there's anything in there that is um, uh, uh, where we have any major disagreement on principle. Um, it's really a matter of staff capacity and what, can, what we can afford and, and finding a way to make sure if it's something that the state needs to fund or whatnot that we, we make those clarifications. So I think we're close. Um, we put a lot, lot, lot of uh, discussion on this, but uh, I think Sonia, uh, if, if Sonia's comfortable with that approach, I'm good to go. All right. You guys good? All right. All right, let's move on. Uh, I'll stop. Let's go. You know, I asked Gary, are we done there? And you said yes. And then we have another 15, 20 minutes. Not so. Uh, so all that's left now is Commissioner Communications. All right. So we have Ken's up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin these remarks, I think I'd like to iterate again that, that um, none of us are particularly pleased with our, our situation regarding um, the restrictions that have been placed upon us by the governor and OHA. Uh, I want to acknowledge that the chair has been aggressive about challenging that, as well as working with Washington County to address it. Um, but in the final analysis, if we can't drive the numbers down that we need to drive down. It does not give the chair the ammunition that he needs in order to unchain us, if you will, from the other counties. So let's keep that in mind. Um, the suggestion that we have not been aggressive about this is incorrect. We have been very aggressive about it. But in the final analysis, OHA is going to give advice to the governor based on the numbers. So it's incumbent upon all of us to do our best to follow the protocols so we can get the numbers that give the chair the ammunition that he needs to have these discussions. On a different note, I want to congratulate staff for their efforts to cobble together funds in partnership with MISO to, to help our businesses in spite of the fact that we have not received CARES funds from the state. 460 applications were received, 200 awards were made to our businesses. Um, it was prioritized in the unincorporated areas of Clackamas County, uh, and our staff are seeking additional funding for a second round of applications. So stay tuned for when we get that um, uh, information and those funds so that we can continue to try and help our business community. I'd also suggest to listeners that if you are in business or know, have a friend in business, to check with Business Oregon for other uh, uh, opportunities to apply for assistance. Um, I met with the Tourism Board, um, and interestingly enough, the, the uh, tourism aspect of things is not as bad as we thought. Um, as I said last week, uh, they had about 20% revenues instead of 10% of revenues at the same time last year. Um, the, the mountain is actually done reasonably well, particularly the short-term rentals. People can drive from around this state, from Washington State, from California, uh, and, and are, are going to the short-term rentals, in many cases taking uh, their own food with them, so they're not spending as much money but just trying to get out of their house in some place where it, that's different uh, on, on vacation. So that has been helpful to our, uh, our short-term rental uh, community up there on the mountain. Um, the national 
association that collects data on travel has found one particularly particularly important point. People are looking at the jurisdictions that are handling COVID well and jurisdictions that are not handling it well. And the jurisdictions that are not handling it well are not getting the tourism that those that do handle it well get. So once again, it's a reminder of how important it is to follow the protocols as best we all can uh, to help rebuild our business community while still trying to keep people as healthy as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, thank you, Ken, because it's a good segue for me. Uh, I had an opportunity for the first time in months, we had a virtual meeting uh, with MPAC last night. And one of the key conversations were, was with uh, actually Metro and Greater Portland Inc. Um, coming together with stakeholders for a strategy for business uh, reopening and resiliency. They're not to the point where they know exactly what that's gonna look like yet. But I do believe they're doing um, an excellent job moving forward with that. And I do know that our economic development staff, uh, John LaGarza in particular, uh, is involved with that. So I'll be talking to him uh, today, I hope. I want to get a hold of Tracy uh, and see where we are in that process. It will go before the entire board of Greater uh, Portland Inc. And I'm very happy that they asked, uh, you know, uh, MPAC for their input. The one thing that I am a little bit concerned about is this. However, um, as you know, our county is suburban, urban, rural, and frontier. And it did become very clear to me as we're going through this conversation about business resiliency that really the focus is truly on the urban and suburban areas. And the question I asked was, if that's where the resources are going to flow, then we need to be more on the ball in other resources for our rural areas of the county, quite frankly. And one resource is the Department of Agriculture Rural Development dollars. Um, I really felt that after that conversation the other night, uh, the two leads on this, uh, uh, frankly, I don't think they understood my question. I don't think they understood the entire uh, size and scope of the county that we're dealing with. And pretty much said, yeah, this is urban suburban um, metrics that's pretty much going to do it. And I do want to remind folks that we have larger traded se sector businesses uh, in some of our uh, outlying cities as well, not just in the urban and suburban area. So I think we need to have a, frankly, a policy conversation in depth at some point about how are we really going to, we're helping the businesses in the unincorporated area with MISO right now, but how are we gonna continue to do that and are there other uh, dollars and resources we can get for those particular areas that will not really be necessarily as involved in the conversations for the urban and suburban areas. So that's kind of my input from MPAC. It was a good discussion. I'm glad they're meeting again. It's been a long hiatus. Um, then we also talked about, uh, you know, the, the uh, transportation measure, and there, there will be more to come on that as well. And uh, Commissioner Fisher, I'm halfway through stamp from the beginning. I've been taking notes. So we should pick a time um, when we have a chance where we can actually discuss this publicly and, you know, have maybe give us a little time, ask the chair uh, to allow us to talk a little bit about this book. I am planting the seed of having the author try and come visit us um, because I think it would be very useful uh, for the whole area. And I would also like to work with the Association of Oregon Counties to help make that happen. I think it would be informative for everyone uh, across the entire state. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, 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 Sonia. I don't have anything to add additionally to what i communicated on tuesday i think i updated a lot on tuesday but martha i so agree with you and i'm not halfway through man you did a lot of reading yesterday but i'm about a quarter of the way through and i am um continuing to learn and be 
um, enriched through reading this book. So hopefully other commissioners will pick it up and read it. That remind me uh, of the name. Ask. It's called Stamped from the Beginning. Stamps? Stamped. And it's okay. the history of racist thought. All right. Thank you. Paul. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to just kind of just touch back. I mean, there's, uh, it's more, this is more of a, it's more of an ask. And, and um, I had a hard time sleeping Tuesday night um, after our discussion on the courthouse. And, um, and, and the reason so is that it's number one, what's on the line is, um, is, is a lot of money and, and the potential to save a lot of money. And I think probably the most frustrating aspect is, is that if we had the potential to save somewhere between 25 and $50 million, and and build the same thing whether 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 or not you choose a P3 or not, um, whether or not you choose a certain design or not, or whether or not you choose a certain timetable or not, we ought to be looking at that opportunity to save that kind of money. We owe it to our taxpayers to to save that kind of money. And I think that what was frustrating for me is that um, uh, for the last couple of years we have been talking about this, the courthouse. I have literally ask for two basic questions. Number one, some to speak with bond counsel so I can ask them some, some basic questions on some of the, the differences and advantages of certain kinds of bonds, terms, rates, and so on. Language that I understand, but I don't have the answers and the expertise of what, that bond counsel has. I've, I, I've asked for that. I've asked for someone who is even close to that, maybe not necessarily bond counsel. So that has not been available to me. Um, I have been asked questions since our Tuesday session by people that have listened to it. And I've expressed my concern that I haven't had the, the adequate staff support, um, whether that's a financial analyst or a bond counsel in order to get some of those specifics to make a intelligent, detailed presentation that I would think that I don't have to make, that I asked to be included for over two years now, or at least at least a year and a half, be included in in our our consideration as an option, and the fact that we never had that option before us, the fact that I had ne never had that those that that uh, staff uh, um, uh, accessibility to answer those questions, um, is is bothersome. And I think that we have we owe, owe an explanation to someone as to why that has not come to be, come to pass, and I. I don't want to. I don't want to pin this on anyone, but I'm just. My plea is to Commissioner Fisher and to Commissioner Bernard, because they are the point people on this courthouse. Um, help me. Help our help our citizens save at least twenty five million dollars, or more. It could be double. And I and and I the vagueness in my my response is whether it's twenty five or twenty six is because I haven't had that that those answers to my questions or or staff availability to me. So I, I, I will not rest comfortably or sleep comfortably if we continue to go on this particular path. Thank you. Well, first off, your assumption is that the voters would support it. Surveys indicated they wouldn't. So we had to look at an alternative way of doing it. All of us have mortgages or have had mortgages, Ken. Uh, but, uh, we know that it costs much more to mortgage, uh, pay it off over time than it does doing a bond measure. I appreciate your efforts to educate us about how that works, but I know how it works. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, we have really worked hard to reach out to the community to, and we, I, I understand all the options. We've had numerous meetings on this. What's important is we know we need a courthouse. It's very likely that the voters will not support a courthouse. So we were trying to not ask them to raise their taxes and see if we could do it internally. I think we are saving the taxpayers money by not asking them to do it and doing it on our own 
within our own budget constraints. Of course, thanking the state of Oregon for their money. Well, for, for my part, I'd like to announce that the 2020 small grant cycle will open for applications Monday, July 13. We'll accept application for four weeks, closing at 5 p.m. on August 6. This year, aside from giving priority to projects that will serve populations located within Clackamas County's Community Prosperity Collaborative, North Clackamas, Estacada, and Canby, we'll be prioritizing the following criteria. To fill an unanticipated expense gap due to COVID-19, focus on serving Black, Indigenous, and people of color, encourage partnerships to increase community impact. So please contact Caroline Hill at 503-655-8262 or Caroline Hill at clackmas.us. And I want a little bit about coordination. No, I've been talking except for this, uh, this week uh, with the chairs of the other two counties, which we are tied to, uh, we have really uh, made an effort to uh, not only work together to get out of this situation, but also uh, in some cases to work separately to get out of this situation where we're tied to Multnomah County. Multnomah County, uh, if really, if Multnomah County wants to get something done, they got to put a little more pressure on the chair. She has not heard a lot of pressure from the community to open up. Multnomah County uh, is different than Clackamas County. Like Martha said, we have various communities, rural, urban, suburban, frontier, I think. I might have missed one. Uh, but uh, in those areas, uh, people may not have been in infected as much. Uh, their statistics don't indicate that. But we are working. Uh, we talk about it every phone call. Uh, Monoma, I mean, Washington County uh, Commission voted unanimously to request the, that the governor allow them to separate from Monoma County. Clackamas County sent a letter uh, asking. Paul sent a letter. Uh, anyway, the, uh, just so in case you guys really want it, here's the governor's cell number. Oops, I lost it. Sorry. I have texted her. I have called her on her cell. And I have pressured all I can. And her answer has been no. And I get it somewhat. Uh, you know, the first case of COVID in Oregon, I believe, was a Washington County resident working in Clackamas County. And the, the virus sees no walls, no barriers. So the trick is wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, and don't be in large groups, please. The more we do that, whether you, it's not political, it's not a joke, we can get out of this if we work together. And truthfully, I don't care what the three chairs want to do or what the county commission wants to do, it's up to you to, fall, to get be out of this. It's up to you. It's not our fault we're closed. It's not the governor's fault it closed. I mean, look at the rest of the states, of the other states, 32 of them may be rolling back. 32 of them are climbing all the time. And the only way out of this is if we follow the rules. And some communities are doing it. Others aren't. Businesses need to ask, I know this is not fun, but I heard a, a, somebody went in a hardware store and, and they said, sir, you have to wear a mask or you can't come in. So they knocked over the shelf of nuts and bolts and left. That's not appropriate. 
it's not a selfish that's very selfish so please wear a mask take care of one another and we can open back up as soon as possible uh so again thank you very much and with that we are adjourned